Welcome back. We're now going to start having a look at vertex shaders. So what have we got here? This is Shader Toy. Now Shader Toy is at shadertoy.com and this is actually my favorite and the one I was showing you earlier working with OpenGL. Shader Toy allows you to create vertex shader code. What it does is it is calculated straight by the GPU. So the graphical processing unit in your computer does it in parallel. It does each pixel. Well, not in parallel, not every one of these pixels, but as many as it can in parallel. Okay. And it only processes one pixel through all of the code in parallel. So it's not like a big array where you're looping through every single pixel and calculating what it's going to look like. It's just like pushing as many as it can at any one time. And so all of this code is relating to one pixel, which is quite amazing. And at first, it's very difficult to get your head around. Now, the objective of this tutorial is not to teach you shader code, because it is a highly mathematical and a complex concept. And if you know it, then fantastic. You can go by leaps and bounds using this sort of stuff. If you want to get to know it, I have a course for that. Of course I do. I have a shader course. It uses a version of this because this is shader, shader code's own version of um, basically vertex shader. OpenGL has its GLSL, which is the OpenGL shader language. Unity Game Engine has its own version as well. And they all pretty much look the same. Once you kind of learn one, the others sort of fall into place for you. Anyway, do check out my shader course because it will give you a bit more confidence with this particular coding and mathematics. But before we get onto that, let's actually have a look at the pipeline that this stuff's going through. If you've done any shader programming before, then most of this will be a snap. Shader programming involves writing the code for the vertex shader, which performs basic processing on each vertex in the scene, and the fragment shader. It's the fragment shader's job to make sense of all the data passed to it and determine the colors of all the pixels in the graphics window. Let's have a closer look at some vertex shader code. What you're going to notice is when we put it into Python, you actually put it in as a multi-lined string, as you can see here, and assign it to a variable. In this case, it's a very, very simple shader code, which works with the vertices to position them on the screen. Now, what you have to remember when you're looking at this type of code is that it's acting per vertex. So it means that every vertex comes into here from your model. So it's a triangle and runs this code. So if there's three points, three vertices in your triangle, it'll run this code three times once for each of those vertices. Now this code is taking in two sets of values, which are both vector threes. Shader code also has access to vector threes, has vector twos, and vector fours. It also has floats and ints and other things as you'll see as we go through. So each vertex in this case is going to be saved in the variable called APOS and the color for that vertex, which you can also store, we haven't looked at that yet, is going to be stored as a vector three in another variable called a color. Now there's going to be a value that comes out of this shader. So things going in are declared as in and values coming out are declared as out. Now, what's coming out of here is the color of our particular vertex because it is required by the fragment shader to draw something that you can see on the screen. This is really basic code and all it's doing is getting the position of the vertex that you're passing in, which is a vector three, making it into a homogeneous coordinate so it's got a one on the end and then setting it to the variable called gl position basically it's taking a position such as let's say five six seven in 3d space and it's converting it into five six seven and putting a one on the end because that becomes a point don't be too concerned about getting all this initially as we'll go through it very soon 
in a hands-on activity in the next video. But what I would like to point out is it looks very much like C code. And this is going to go into a variable in Python, but it has to have semicolons on the end. And when you're used to not putting semicolons on the end in one language, and then you come over here to do it in this language, then you can easily get a lot of errors, but it's okay because we can work through those as we go. Right, let's have a look at what a fragment shader looks like. Okay, so here's a fragment shader. Now, what the fragment shader is going to do is, as I said before, work out what color any particular pixel needs to be on the screen. And it does that using the information about the vertices and colors and textures and whatever else gets passed through to the vertex shader. And as you can see in this bit of code here, we're taking an in vector three, which is the color which came out of that vertex shader. And we're processing it, not very much at all, we're actually just turning it from a vector three color into, again, homogeneous co coordinates of a vector four and returning that as the fragment color. To run the pipeline, we feed it an array of values that become the vertex specifications. We can also include color information and other things like textures in these arrays too. Unlike the way we were specifying triangles previously, these arrays have to be ready to go with the vertices in triangle making order. The vertex shader calculates the final position on the screen of each vertex, once for every vertex passed to it. After this, there are two optional functions, tessellation and geometry shading. Tessellation can be used to divide meshes into more triangles in order to make a mesh smoother. And the geometry shader works to determine how geometry is interpreted. And we've already looked at that in previous OpenGL programs that we've written, such as the GL lines or the GL triangles, because we can give it the same data, but can actually be interpreted differently to produce a different image. Then the vertex post-processing occurs. Now there's very little control that the user has over this. And this is basically where the clipping occurs that gets rid of any vertices that aren't required for drawing the final lot of pixels. Primitive assembly turns the vertices into ordered sets of primitive drawing objects, such as lines, points, or triangles. This is then passed to the most important stage of rasterization, which basically gives us our pixel map or what eventually will become the pixels on the screen. So we've taken lines, primitives and vertices and through rasterization ended up with a map that's going to cover the entire screen. Now there could be multiple what are called fragments uh, which are kind of like pixels but they're the bits that haven't been processed to become pixels yet and so there might be multiple fragments that then get passed to the fragment shader, that's for any one pixel location, and the fragment shader then makes it into the final color. Finally, the per sample operations determine which objects produce which pixels, so therefore you can do further operations on how those pixels are either blended or depth tested or any other masking operations that you want to perform on them. Okay, that's enough of the theory. When we come back in the next lecture, we'll actually start putting the code in. If you'd like to support our work, like us on YouTube, visit our website holistic3d.com, look for our courses on holistic3dlearn.com or support us on Patreon.